Hello and welcome to the Rift Valley Network Reading Group. My name is Richard Griscom and I'm serving as the host today. Today we're actually having a webinar to introduce a new series for the Reading Group. The new series is called Auxiliaries and Credit Complexes in the Tanzanian Rift and I'll provide a brief introduction to the topic. Uh, auxiliaries and Credit Complexes are a common grammatical trait present in many of the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area and they're also considered to be an aerial feature of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. Uh, this thematic series for the reading group will span six meetings. Uh, they will be led by Andrew Harvey, Martin Mouse, Hannah Gibson, and myself. And we hope to survey some of the literature uh, concerning these uh, phenomena of auxiliaries and credit complexes. Um, and we hope they will serve as a form for advancing our understanding of these phenomena. The first session of this series, which is today, will be a presentation given by Martin Mouse introducing the topic. Uh, Martin has a reading which he has uh, provided to me and I will share that uh, once he begins his talk. I will put the link into the chat and then you can download the reading if you'd like to read at your own pace. So Martin Mouse is a professor of African linguistics at Lyon University, and his research focuses on the description of Cushitic languages, including Iraq and Alagua, as well as the exploration of language and identity, valence changing verbal derivations, and the languages of East and West Africa. Please join me in welcoming him as he gives his talk, Critic Complexes in an African Typological Perspective. Yeah, thank you, uh, Richard. Um, I had to think a little bit about what to, what to present today. Um, in a way, it's a combination of things that uh, I've done in the past, but I also had to be careful not to include too much about the articles that we're going to read later. So, for example, I have an article on Cushitic uh, uh, critical complexes. I won't uh, discuss that much. And um, what I will uh, use is actually two activities that, uh, that I was involved uh, in a uh, long time ago, decades ago. One was a, um, a workshop at, a, at the Vocal in Rutgers about X, S, X, O, V, other. Um, and we had prepared that, we as Stephen Elders and myself, and we had prepared a kind of a questionnaire for that workshop. And now this, that questionnaire is included at the very end of this uh, paper. Uh, the other uh, uh, workshop was um, later on, uh, on specific Cushitic critic complexes, Southern, but mostly Eastern Cushitic, including also Omotic languages. And um, for that one, we also had a, a questionnaire of things to look at, and also that one is added at the very end of this uh, of this presentation. So I hope you can see my text. And it says here 20 pages, but don't you worry, the last pages are just those questionnaires. So I begin with the abstract, but I skip the abstract because this is the abstract that I uh, used for the announcement, and what I'll do is maybe slightly different. <clears throat> so I, I won't go through too much into that uh, a typology article on the Cushitic uh, Clitic Complexes. One thing that I want to take out of that is that the Cushitic Clitic Complexes do not have an auxiliary at their basis. So they are really all, yeah, uh, grammatical elements. But because to me an auxiliary is, can also be used as a main verb with lexical meaning in addition to its auxiliary use. So in that sense, the Cushitic ones are, are different. So what I will do is I'll talk a little bit about the Cushitic because that is what we have at the core in the Tanzanian Rift Valley for this, this phenomenon. But I will compare that to, to the West African uh, situation and uh, because that, that always fascinated me. I worked quite a bit on uh, Bantu language, Tunen, which has an X, S, Ox, O, V, other order. And um, uh, in a way that's very similar to Iraq, but it's also very different. 
So I want to, to use a comparison on these two sides of the African continent to, to get some insight in, in what kind of questions we should ask ourselves for the understanding of the structural features of these cryptic complexes, not so much the morphological ones, type logic, but not so much what can be expressed on it, but more what is the syntax of it and how are they different uh, between uh, East Africa and West Africa. So sentence one, Inos Yakta Hawati Malihanis. Uh, we have an Iraqu sentence and I'm talking about, I don't know whether you will see my cursor, but I'm talking about this thing, uh, which is glossed as B and three, indicating that the subject is a third person. Um, that is in, in Southern Cushitic studies called the selector. I will call it the selector. I will talk about this critic complex here. Here is just one critic. And then at the end of the sentence, we have the verb and these. And I will refer to what comes in, but what come, but the, the, the selector, the critic complex plus the, the verb. I will call it the, the verb race. So some things will be inside it and some, some things won't be. And there are all sorts of syntactic uh, constraints on that. For example, in Iraqu, if the object, as in this case, is within the verbal brace, then it needs to be in a, in a construct case. Uh, you can have, uh, you can have uh, constituents with a with case clitic on it. You can have certain adverbs within the verbal phrase. That's more or less it. Alakwa, there I have as a, a clitic complex. Loso, it's a bit more complex as an optative beneficent marked by the S and an object, a masculine object, because it's a, the Juma that we're talking about. And, um, and here's the verb. So here we see that there's actually nothing between the clitic complex and the verb. Then Burungi Anafu Mahank Hagliniri, take an example from Poland, where the clitic complex is quite complex. It has the subject indication, the object indication, indication that the object is in focus, and then a communicative. Ich esse diese Bai zusammen mit diesem Fly. So I eat uh, the Bali together with meat. Riba Goba, not with milk. Um, this kind of uh, structure, which is uh, common in uh, in the Cushitic uh, Tanzanian languages, is of course reminiscent. Well, of course, I mean, if you know about Somali, about the Somali structure. The Somali sentences here in four A, B, C, they have a focus marker. Every clause in Somali. More or less every clause, it's not exactly true. More or less every clause requires a focus marker. And in that focus marker, you often have the subject indication. And between the focus marker and, and the verb, so the verb is here, the aratai, we can have an object uh, like uh, libar, line. Um, the in the, the, the Somali syntacticians, they sometimes they talk about uh, the verbal brace, they call it the verbal piece as being from the from the clitic complex up to the verb. Here there is nothing in between. And here also there is nothing in between, but here we see the line in between. And some others uh, specifically in the more um, who work in the generative frame, they will call it from the subject marker up to the verb. But I mean, subject markers are always criticized to some kind of focus marker. So this is the, the main or word or the options in the Somali clause. You have all these focus markers with subject pronoun, sometimes without subject pronoun. And an object can be between the focus marker and the verb. But in Somali, also a subject can do that. It's not possible in Tanzania and Kushidik, but in Somali it can. We can have things after the verb. We'll come back to the options after the verb later. 
um, this kind of similar syntax, the superficially similar syntax of Iraqo and Somali is also similar to Mande. The Mande languages have a very rigid order, subject, predicative, equal predicative, predicateur, object, verb, other. So this subject can often be uh, just a pronoun and then the subject and the predicative they can fuse. The predicative can be just a tonal marking, uh, but the object will always be between that, always within what I have been calling the verbal place. <clears throat> not all the uh, not uh, not all the, the clauses in all the languages have this structure. There are also languages we don't so without the predicative, but the object is typically typically necessarily between the predicate mark and the in the verbal place. Others can be all sorts of things: adjuncts, adpositional phrases. Uh, remember adpositional phrases. But we have a few examples from Mandinka. Uh, so where we have the subject with the definite marker, this is the predicative, the hunter, the object, in the brace, and then the verb to herd. So the line has heard the hunter. But that can be used for all sorts of clauses, not only for this uh, past tense, but also for a negative one with another predicative marker, it's not that the hunter, and also for the more for the potential marker. Uh, all the, for all of those, the object uh, occurs in the verb place. Of course, this was uh, well known and uh, Heine, um, when he did his typology of word order, of word, word order in African languages, he, uh, he took this as one of the, the types. So Heine has four types, A, B, C, D, and his type B, is the Monday type. For him, Monday is a rigid type B. Um, so this, he did this more or less the same time that uh, a bit after Greenberg did his typology, but it's different in a number of ways. And uh, Heine, I just mentioned that here, maybe it's not so important B, because, but he characterized Iraq as A or D or both. That top has A, Sandawa has D, Masa has C, Norway has A. So A is subject for object. I guess all the other languages will be like that, almost all. Sukuma is also A. Hadza would be C, for initial, Somali D, for final, and then Bantu language of Cameroon also B. These are his categorizations. It's not that important for us whether they're correct. We can have a different idea about it. Um, but uh, just to let you know, for him, type B, which is the uh, the extra one, so to speak, is is uh, is characterized by the fact that the genitive comes before the noun, whereas the nominal qualifiers go after follow the noun, the head noun. So genitive before the head noun, and the nominal qualifiers after the head noun. A lang language with postpositions, adjectives preceding, demonstratives, etc. But then he says the decisive difference between the two types, type B and D, is that in D languages the verb follows the adverbial phrase, whereas in B languages it precedes the adverbial phrase. So the position of the adverbial phrase is to him central to, to what, um, what is B or D. And then as I said, Manding is Richard B, but also Sinufo, Bariba, Sene, Tumale, uh, languages of West Africa, but also Taig Tagoy of the Kurdistan, Tune, the Bantu language in, in Cameroon, and he says, I don't know about this, but one dialect of Songhai. Within D, he has, and also with some of the other uh, types, he has subtypes. So in D, he has Oromo, Kafa, and Amharic as uh, subtypes. Uh, that depends more or less on the on border within the noun phrase. He says, D languages tend to have tense after the verb. Uh, that is valid for the Cushitic languages if we look at inflection. However, if we look at the tense in the Peter complex, this is not valid at all. So the difference between a high and a, that, that why Greenberg's uh, topology is to remember now by everyone and behind us is maybe forgotten, is of course mainly because uh, Greenberg's topology then 
was uh, developed into redefinition of the, of, of the generalizations and uh, we, we uh, interpreted this concept of dominance of headedness and, uh, uh, to the left or to the right and that was the important next step in the development of uh, syntactic theory uh, which of course was impossible with highness topology with more uh, types and more subtypes Okay, uh, I, I talked about Monday, Monday with this rigid, 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 rigid uh, S predicative object verb order, or dominant, that one. But then, otherwise in Niger Congo, in West Africa, we have S ox object verb order. So how is that different? Well, it is different mainly in that I use the, the term ox here. Um, but that has consequences because typically for, for these languages uh, it is the structure that is not valid for all the tenses and aspects. So for some of them the object will come after the verb, for some others it will be if between the ox and the verb in the verbal phrase. Um, and that position, if it's not depending on tense aspect, it will also affect information structure. Which is also does in, in, in Kushitic, remember, so highly we had to focus markers. So, as an example of this kind of S Ox of the other language, I, uh, I take uh, Tikak, Pantot language of Cameroon. Um, subject, she gave indirect object food object. So, that is a common order, but you can also have the order with the the future auxiliary marker, where you have the subject auxiliary marker, the indirect object, and then the object, and then the verb. These orders, indirect object, like here, indirect object closest to the verb and then the object is, is, is mandatory for the ones that come after the uh, verb, and mandatory for the ones that come in the verbal place. And then, there's a close set of adverbials that follow the predicative mark immediately. So they are inside the verbal brace, inside this, this auxiliary and, and the verb. And they are uh, adverbs like, again, contrary to expectation, also only in contrast to right now, first, quickly, usually. Uh, remember this because uh, this is also valid for some of the languages in the, in the RIF. If we look at the order of imperatives, it's verb, indirect, or the object. And um, imperative doesn't have a, a predicative marker that is valid for all the languages that I've mentioned so far. So it will always be important to look at what is the order in the imperative. And then I have an example from TC, uh, Southern Atl Atlantic, quite far to the south of West Africa, just to show you that this kind of structure um, is, is quite widespread and is not confined to a certain uh, language family. It's quite common in, in Kru. It happens in, in Gur specifically, Sinufo. But uh, as you see, we have it also in Atlantic, Bantoid, and a number of others. So I will go on, on the, about the syntactic property. So uh, I use this term lytic uh, complex and yeah, the term lytic can, can be uh, cause confusion but sometimes people understand different things about it. Uh, it can be either seen as a, as a syntactic thing and then uh, yeah, in, the, in the theory of, uh, in the, uh, of the syntactic theory you would call this a clitic. Um, and it can be a phonological, morphological thing, like something that doesn't have word and that needs another thing to, to be uh, to be aware. I use it in both uh, meanings, so I think we would have to uh, indicate that these things are actually clitics. And for a lot of the examples that you've seen, they're, they're actually written as separate words. Um, for those Cushitic languages, yes, they are written as separate words, but they themselves can criticize to the left. So we have to know to what direction the critics complex uh, criticizes is something to always uh, 
take into account. Actually, this is true for all of them, also for the West African ones. It's always left to us with the civilization. We have mentioned a few times the uh, placement uh, in the vertebrae between the critic complex and the verb. And uh, I will quote uh, Roland, uh, who summarizes that placement of the verb, I think, on Alakwa, but it's valid for Jimmy in Tanzania. It's a syntactic device placing it within the verbal base for tying up information which is composed of at least two conceptual units or entities into a single compact bundle, which is to be analyzed without internal structure anymore. So the incorporate, incorporated constituent loses syntactic and conceptual independence, merging with the verbal complex to form a monolithic conceptual block. Well, nicely formulated. Uh, I have some examples from, from Iraku which show what is, uh, uh, what is meant in the, in the number B, Kahavala. Uh, that is uh, what uh, huh? I'm drinking water. Uh, that's what I do right now. But if you put a coffee uh, in the brace between the selector and the verb, it means I'm a coffee drinker. So coffee and drink is, has become one conceptual unit. <laughs> That is what it means by that. So it has to do with backgrounding. Um, and then after the verb, can we put things after the verb? Well, in Iraq, we cannot, oh, we can a little bit. So we can put uh, here the gazelle after the verb ot, the other gazelle in Pala after the verb ot, and then the elephant before the clitic complex and the verb ot to get. Um, these are examples that were rejected by my speakers when I was doing recitation. But I got them in, uh, in, in stories and uh, they're absolutely fine. So it's a very specific function for it. Uh, these uh, post-verbal objects, they indicate that this is going towards a climax. We have a gazelle, we have a bigger one, and then the, the, the main thing will come in the last one, and will be in uh, will be marked as thematic by putting it in the front before the critic complex. Um, there's another way you, you, that you can uh, put in Iraq or put things after the verb, and that is by the uh, yeah. But sorry, this I call this a resumptive pronoun, maybe. Better word is a resumptive verb. So what it does is, if you sa should be within the verbal brace between ina and dakaika. You can say that ina basira sa dakaika. But if you find well, this is a bit uh, too much. Uh, let me put sa after the verb. It can only be licensed if there is something replacing function in the verb the complexity, and that is the ali. But the other Cushitic languages in Tanzania, they show much more freedom of placement of the object. So the placement of the object after the verb is quite common in Alakwa, also in Burundi, and, uh, and, and also within it. So you have it here. You have the object, the Dari, after the verb. Here you have the object before the Celtic complex, outside of the place of the sentence. And here you have the that way within the brace of the clause, with it between the critical complex and the verb. All of them are possible. And um, uh, yeah, my, my good feeling is that this, this order is came as a result of a lot of contact with uh, the Bantu. But it would be interesting to look into more detail uh, whether these orders are, uh, what kind of functions they have within the Tanzanian Kushi. Um, so I've told you that putting the, the object in the, that was the coffee, uh, inside the verbal brace has a backgrounding function. That is actually also what we see in the Thai B languages of West Africa. Uh, this is from Tunen, Mendo Bonyaka Ne. The object I'm eating uh, yams is, doesn't have real contrast. Uh, so this is the neutral way of saying this. But you can also say, 
Mendonne a cognac. No, I'm not eating uh, ugali, I'm eating yams. And then you put the yams after the, the verb. So for the languages in West Africa, people often talk between the immediately before verb uh, position for background and the immediately after verb position for focusing. This is way too simple and also in two and it looks a bit more complicated than this. But um, then what we have in Tunan and what we also have in, on, in all the other languages of uh, as ox of the other, of the West Africa, not the Monday, but the West African type, is that position of the object before the verb or after the verb is a matter of, like here, of information structure. But uh, what we have in the D languages, so that is Hiraku, we have more an uh, option of putting the objects before the Kete complex or after the Kete complex. So having been thematic before the Kete complex or having been backgrounded after the Kete complex and before the verb. But then my question is, and I will, I will mention a number of research questions that I have. It's just a very personal set of questions that I hope that, that, that will come up uh, in the rest of the meetings. But what does verb object in Tanzania Kushitics do to the syntax? Does it really have also effect on the overall syntax? And uh, how do the Tanzanian Rift uh, Valley languages fare in relation to placement before or after that the complex and before or after the verb? So now, not just for the Kushitic ones, but Kushri, for Bantu, for uh, Gatunga, for Hadza, for Sandawa, Masai. And as I mentioned, imperatives. I would say always look at the imperatives uh, because the Cushitic languages, they have the object verb order in imperatives and as we saw before, the West African types have also have always for, for object order. So this type B and D, what does the real difference mean? Well, maybe one of the differences is the placement of the verb as I mentioned, but I think also the position of the object is in the imperatives. So can we relate this verb object order versus object verb order in imperatives with other exam with other features of this whole phenomenon? And actually the same is something that I would uh, hope that we can look at is that the secondary predication and secondary predication mainly for objects. So we, we call this child uh, Richard or we call this from Bogo. That is what they mean with secondary predication. So the main thing is before the verb and what it is called, what is uh, e uh, equated with it is after the verb. This is how it is in Sunufo. We have another example here. Um, but this is actually also how it can be in, in Alaka. No, uh, that is, uh, sorry, Sunufo, I'm going too fast. Yeah, the fast for myself. Um, so in Sinufo, the, the base thing that you equate is before the verb and it's equated with something after the verb. And in Alakwa, it's uh, the, those of the mother, uh, the eyes, the eyes are the, are the possessed part of the mother. So the, the major one is before the pith complex. And then what is part of that in uh, sort of possessor raising, well, it's not really the raising, is uh, the, the, the verbs, the, the, sorry, the eyes uh, after the pith complex in this Alakwa sentence. Same here, uh, he grabbed the castrated bull by its tail. So castrated bull, the tail is part of the same bull, bull, and it will be after the, the, the complex. So what are the positions for secondary application in Tanzania with the languages? Not only the other ones, but also the other ones. I don't know for the other ones, I have no data on that. And then another one would be, I don't go into that, but in Iraq, it's really interesting. The object, the place of the object of the verbal noun, the semantic object of the verbal noun versus the infinitive topic for another. Yeah, I'm going to write something about it. I could share that. Um, 
placement of the adverbs. I come back to that. We remember uh, what was it? Uh, uh, tika, which had a number of uh, of adverbs that had to be in the place between the triplicate complex and the and the verb. We also have that uh, for Iraku. Uh, Mak things that turn out to be different in Ferron and Chua. Uh, uh, very true. Tawo uh, without result. Ho. Uh, Absolutely true, even if you think otherwise. Co, just emphasis. So these are quite similar to the set of adverbs that um, that the tika would allow and would require to be in the verbal place. This is the same for Iraku. These ones ever was there too already there too again. These ones uh, early, uh, quickly, firstly. All of those they were shared with the ones for. Uh, for uh, Tika, and they have to be within the verbal base in Tika and in Iraq. Also, in Western, but not in Eastern Kuhn, the position of the verb base is prohibited for adverbs, so that also uh, restrictions over where adverbs can be. That depends, of course, what you call the adverb, because these are not here the things like tomorrow uh, or uh, in, in the garden. Those kind of adverbials, they do not occur in the verbal place. So in Iraq, we have to talk about two kinds of adverbs. But there is something reoccurring that certain types of adverbs, at least types of firstly, quickly, early, ever, again, already, but they uh, tend to be uh, preferred to be within the place for a number of these languages that are unrelated and different types of adverbs. So that is my research question six. Uh, the different ways. I've been talking about putting something within the place or, or outside the place. And this is the way I, I superficially uh, think about it. But that's, of course, not really necessary. And specifically for Conso, Conso has a lot of these uh, case critics that, um, that are there in every sentence, in, uh, specifically in Ethiopia. And that oh, also they can also precise to the right in exceptional case, the whole critic uh, complex. And um, they, uh, yeah, the, to me, the intuitive simple thing is to talk about it like put the case critic after the, the constituent that you want to put in focus, whatever focus means. But uh, a, a very different way of putting it, what a lot of syntacticians will do is say, well, let us move the things and put them outside the focus and put them after the, the complex. There's two different ways of, of looking at it. These are the examples of, uh, of console. Here, when you bought food in C1, it's criticized to the uh, object food. Uh, but you bought food, now it's criticized to the verb, and it gives difference in, in uh, focus on the, on the object or on the verb. So here in, in uh, console, you can criticize to the right. Uh, as an example, uh, Example to what I said before. So it all has to be, uh, all, uh, it's mostly about, um, yeah, selective focus on, on the object. So I looked at you. And if it's the U is before the Twitter complex, changes this. Uh, but this is all, uh, this is console. When you put this uh, before uh, the verbal complex, the Twitter complex, then it means that the U is, is, select, is selected from a selection, from, from, a, from a collection. So you will see U but not certain others that are also there. Um, they do not express selective focus on the subject. So for many of them, uh, we don't, it's not uh, subject focus. It is in Somali, it is to some extent in Konsu. Um, and so yes, in here I say, what moves the clitic complex of the argument? And uh, in, we, in some of the languages we talk about, uh, 
uh, with the complexes moving to Tom Freddy, who works in the, in the generative framework, he told me, well, think about it from the other way around. And I think that is useful. Uh, constituency. Uh, there's a problem with constituency. In, for Somali, we talk about the verbal piece. I've been talking about the verb race. We clearly need to talk about this entity. But, I mean, what is it? Is it a verb phrase? What can it be? It's a, it's a, it's, it's a challenge for syntactic theory. Um, is it a constituent? Yes, in a number of ways it is clearly a constituent because in Somali, the order within that constituent is very strict very much regulated, a bit less so in Iraqu, but there are very uh, uh, clear and strong uh, restrictions on what can be in it and what not. Uh, this is a bit on Somalia and Iraqu. I will, I, will, I will just go towards the Tanzanian Rift Valley Sprachpunkt now. I won't say too much about that because I mean, the article that uh, Derek and Roland and he wrote uh, in another life will also be discussed in this uh, series. And uh, yes, as uh, Richard said in his introduction, one of the most spectacular things was this, this ethic complex that is a common for so many of the languages of the Rift Valley, Tanzanian Rift Valley. Um, yeah, and um, so um, I, I'm, I'm not into Sprachpunkt anymore, maybe I never was, but uh, we, uh, we submitted an article to, um, to uh, a book with the title. And to me, Sprachpunkt is a geographical area where there's a lot of linguistic similarity as a con consequence of language contact. Um, but when do we talk about language contact? And I, like, I would like to point out to Thomason, who has put up a number of criteria five um, that you have to follow in order that you can positively say this is a case of language contact. Uh, so first of all, which is maybe not that much a criteria, but an advice, look at the language as a whole. So if, if there is structural interference of any kind, and she's talking about uh, contact-induced structural change, not lexical change, so if the structure of the of any kind, then it must be, must have happened at several places in the system. So make sure that that's the case. Identify a source language. Identify shared structural features in the proposed source and receiving language. But then, and that is a challenge, prove that the proposed interference feature did not exist in the receiving language before it came into contact and prove that the proposed interference uh, feature were present in the source language before it came into contact with receiving languages. And that these two that are often not, not, not really looked into and that we do need to do to make a strong case for, for real language contact. Then uh, I think this is also an important thing that she says in the addendum at the end, an external cause does not exclude an internal cause for language change, contact and use language change. Multiple causation is common and a complete explanation for a given change in a contact situation must take potential internal as well as external motivations into account. So it's not one of the other, but one or the other, but look at both. Um, I, here I look at the families, but I don't really, because I think we're going to do that in the, in the, in the coming weeks. East African Bantu, so we have, we have some, uh, in the article, uh, Naturu, uh, to some extent, Miramba, is discussed and is uh, interpreted, reinterpreted by their as, uh, as having 10 sub subject, 10 suspect as a conglomerate, then you can have something, and then you can have that again, plus the verb, and you can have something between those two, or between the subject and the aspect and the verb. So that is very similar to the Tanzanian Kushita kind of structures, but it is not uh, not restricted to to Naturo or uh, to the Bantu languages in our area. So we have to take that into account. The Toga, uh, in our article, we have some examples of an adverb and a subject to illustrate the separability of the verb 
and the sequential cryptic. Uh, um, I know nothing about Catoga, but people here who know much more about it, so I'm very curious in how they would analyze what we have uh, suggested for a complex critic, complete complex in Catoga. For Kushirik, it is the constructor of the rest of Sala Kushirik, uh, it's a bit uh, uh, difficult if we go at the Y area, South Kushirik, okay? but that's mainly because we don't know those other languages of South Kushirik. They are not part of it or they are not spoken anymore. So, but most people would say South Kushirik is part of East Kushirik. So we can look at East Kushirik and let's say that South and East Kushirik, one, a family together, and then could we reconstruct that for the southeast Cushitic uh, branch? Uh, that's a challenge. I mean, yes, it is uh, rampant in East Cushitic, this kind of uh, syntax. But here we have our body, the man subject. Here we have this little uh, complex. We have the object and we have the verb to cut. So here the object comes within the verbal brace between the critical complex and the verb. And um, well, there are some properties there. But uh, uh, Hayward has a very interesting analysis of how that came about in, in our border. And he sees that as a sort of grammaticalization of clefting as a focus strategy. And that, uh, and that gave rise to um, to this uh, as a remnant of the copula of the clefton construction that gave rise to a cathetic complex and a, and a reanalysis of the syntax. Um, Sandawe, we say something in the in the in the in the things in the Rift Valley Sprachmund article a little bit about Sandawe. I think much more is known now about Sandawe. So much more detail could be, uh, and we could be, uh, this could be expanded, I'm sure. And also Hatsa, I'm very curious to, to learn more about Hatsa. But we uh, found examples where we have a clitic complex and a verb and an object between the two, and also ones. Yeah. So um, this was uh, my introduction to the topic. It's more syntactic than the other article, which I have appreciated, which is more typological, morphological. So uh, how many different types of phenomena do we have? I put here romance, but maybe I should take that out. What kind of parameters do we have for grouping? Is it the verb object in, in the imperative, the, the order in secondary implication, or that does that? enable us to make clusters of, uh, of, yeah, of features that go together and, um, and what is the nature of the pragmatic mapping. And yeah, what is it re recurrent history in the, in the, in, in the or is it, has it happened at that time? So the, um, these questions are a bit more on the synchronic analytic side, but I think very interesting question that I can't say much about is, yeah, what is the, um, uh, can we really show that some of these similarities in structures in, in, in the non-Tanzanian Cushitic languages in the Rift Valley are contact-induced structural changes? Um, uh, then if, if we can or make it plausible, how, what kind of scenario can we actually think of that that has happened? In, where did it start? Because um, yes, it, we can reconstruct it for Southern Kushidik, but Southern Kushidik is not that long ago, and they also could have developed it from some other language. So these, uh, uh, sorry for the list of references, I, I in, in attempt not to miss anything, I just put all the ones that I had before. But here you see the checklist for the Kushidik and the model flexible subject critics forms of the subject critic, position of the subject critic, present and absence of the critic, other person marking. This is the questionnaire that we have for our workshop on Cushitic uh, critics. And then with uh, Stephen Elders, 
that I'm in Bible to be made a student of checklist. Actually, should stop now, but I'm not ready. I'm done for the vocal at Rutgers. Yes, Richard, I, right. I stopped talking. Okay, thank you, Martin, for your presentation. Uh, now we can begin the question and answer section. So if anyone would like to ask a question or offer a comment, you can do so using the Zoom chat module. And I will start with my own question and a couple of comments actually to give the other participants time to write their own questions and comments. So my first comment is that I, I really appreciated all of the open questions that you posed in your presentation. Uh, some about Cushitic languages, some about other languages of the Rafale area, and some about uh, languages even outside of Africa. And I, I appreciated this because I thought it was really reflective of the whole reason that we even started the network, which is that we know there are questions that we'd like to answer, but we aren't able to answer them on our own or by looking at just one language or one family. But we actually, we need to uh, help each other to look at a, a large amount of data from various sources to answer these questions. So thank you for that. My second comment, uh, just briefly regarding the separability of the verb of the future and the, um, well, the, the separability of the, the future and the sequential procodex in Kisamjanga de Toga. Uh, so I haven't observed that in SMJ de Toga, or I haven't seen it yet, at least. Um, but in all the varieties that I'm familiar with, uh, it seems to be clear that at least some of the tense aspect prefixes and the, or, or procodex, if you want to analyze them that way, are of uh, verbal origin, uh, mm -hmm. which is somewhat different, I think, from uh, Cushitic. Yeah. Uh, so my question then, uh, one of the problems in, in determining whether or not some feature um, exists in a language uh, due to contact is that uh, you need to actually assign a time for contact. And many of these groups have potentially been in contact uh, at various points in the past 2000 or so years. So I uh, just wonder if you can speak to that. For example, if we're thinking of uh, Southern Nilotic languages and Cushitic languages, uh, there's been contact very recently, but there also potentially was contact uh, much, uh, much further back in time. Um, so how, how do we tease apart those differences? How do we choose a, a time for contact and um, how do these, uh, how does the timing of contact for different groups together relate to this notion of a Sprach Bund or an area? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for the comments. Um, and, and yes, I, uh, I wasn't so sure that uh, there is a real critical complex in, in, in the Datoga languages. Um, what, they, what they have there in the Datoga languages for the sequential, that kind of thing seems to me uh, um, very uh, similar to, to what has developed in Naturu. So I, I think that maybe Naturu has been influenced structurally by Datoga. For the question, that's of course a very difficult question. Um, I would, I would um, so yeah, we have, to, we have to work with a number of hypotheses. One of them for me would be that uh, Tanzanian Southern Nilotic uh, was, was really uh, one branch of Southern Nilotic, a Toga plus, let me call it that. Um, but so um, uh, determining whether, whether there was something like a critical complex, if it is in, in some current Toga uh, languages, uh, but if it isn't, in, uh, in, uh, cannot be shown to exist in Southern Nilotic at large, Kalenjin, then, uh, then I would say uh, that criterion is, uh, is, uh, um, is met and then uh, it is an innovation in, in that topic. If it is there, probably isn't there. And, um, and then we, uh, we, can, we can, I think, uh, show that uh, it is present in, uh, in reconstructed uh, West Rift. Um, and then we have to uh, have some assumptions on the whether West Rift predated the entry of Tanzanian Southern Nilotic or not. And that is a very difficult one because it probably didn't, unfortunately. So that, that, that poses problems for our scenario. But um, yeah, we, uh, <clears throat> we would have to uh, do that actually as a second 
criterion to, to show that it was there in the language with which it was in contact. But I think for these clinic complexes, if there's any real comparable thing in that toga, it's, well, I hopefully not the case for all of them. And then, then it will be easier to, to come up with a scenario of the contact in use structural change. Not so easy then who influenced what, because that will depend a lot on which group it is and where they were and with whom they were in contact. Does right. that answer your question? Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. Just to follow up briefly. Um, yeah, I think that just uh, highlights this idea in my mind again, how important it is uh, to to start research on the Datoka varieties in, in the, the Mara region yeah. uh, who have not had much contact with the Iraq, but then also uh, the Bianjida uh, much farther to the south. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, work on, on, on those varieties, I think could help us to answer some of these questions. Yeah, and, and the, uh, the, the differentiation within Datoga is, is quite, uh, it's quite impressive. And, and it is only in the last years that we get some idea about it. No, it's, uh, we, we were depending on, on Gotland, and that was very sketchy. Right. Uh, About the, uh, just to come back to the nilotic, the early nilotic Cushitic contact, uh, that will be very difficult to tease out. Uh, I think we can probably only see that, we can only do that in lexicon, because it's very difficult to reconstruct syntactic structures. And, uh, I, 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 I'm sure that there is a Cushitic nilotic contact in the uh, Turkana region, um, but, but maybe that was uh, so long ago that, um, that it was a, a predecessor of Southern nilotic and a predecessor of Southern Cushitic. But we, are, we, we, we actually can't say much about that, ex apart from the fact that we know that it was there. Okay, thank you. Let's see if we have a question. Yes, we have a um, question or a comment. I can't tell yet. We'll find out when I get to the end of it from uh, Andrew Harvey. Obviously, there are at least two analyses that can be made, modo grosso. One, looking at the forms of these codec clusters, tracing their provenance, etc. And two, looking at the functions of the codec complexes and how they are manipulated to express different meanings and probably from our perspective, how they suggest similarities and differences between the languages we're interested in. My question is, do you think that an analysis of these functions is far enough along for good reliable generalizations to be made? Or is this really still an open question? I, I think we will look at the, f at the functions, but also at the forms, actual forms. And even if the forms aren't, uh, aren't taken over, because that is very often the case, we would, we would need to think why a specific form was, was reanalyzed in, in a specific language. I have, I have concentrated here on the function in the word order and, 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 and all of that, m not because I'm not interested in what is actually expressed in these critic complexes, I am, but uh, because uh, I didn't want to take away the, the floor for the uh, article I think that Hannah will discuss on the on the selectors of Kushitic, which goes purely on what is actually expressed on the kit, kit complex. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have something from Hannah Gibson. She says, at the beginning of the talk, you define auxiliaries as those which still have lexical meaning. Yeah. Under this approach, what do you do about processes of grammaticalization from auxiliary to verb, etc.? I'm thinking more of Bantu here, probably. Or so, uh, she says, sorry, that probably should have been verb to auxiliary. So gra grammaticalization processes of verb to auxiliary. Yeah, I, I, I've made a distinction just to make clear that, uh, that in many of the Cushitic languages, uh, it, it, they are, these are not and they haven't come from verbs, but they've come from more copula and uh, kind of things, um, if you consider those uh, different entities, of course. And um, so, yes, it's, uh, it's, that's something I wanted to emphasize, that's the difference there. Um, what I see with the, the auxiliaries, and it's a little bit of a strict definition, but just to make the difference that even if you widen that with auxiliaries, 
those that also have lexical meaning of those that once had lexical meaning. And I wouldn't be against uh, um, just um, just extend, expanding it to that. Um, they what you what you see a lot of them in in West Africa and 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 yes in Bantu, all over Bantu. And um, I think uh, this is a different dynamic because there is there is still some even if it's grammaticalized there's still some some lexicality uh, lexical meaning there's some some lexical semantics in the kind of meaning that is expressed in the in that uh, clitic complex so of course it will be very interesting to 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 look in into the development of verbs to uh, to clitics and how they uh, lose more and more of the uh, uh, lexical semantics, but I think it's also in potential just in different dynamics for for the syntax. It's easier to have variation um, in word order and things like that. Well, uh, I think I will take this opportunity to introduce the the next meeting of the reading group which will take place in two weeks time. So this is on the 27th of May. Andrew Harvey will be uh, hosting a reading group session on, uh, let's see, the, oh, the, the chapter of the Tanzania and Rift Valley area that you had just mentioned, Martin, uh, specifically uh, the section on auxiliaries or coded complexes. So that again will be in two weeks time and that will be the first reading group discussion as a part of this series. Again, there will be, uh, there will be six uh, meetings in that reading group series. So I'd like to thank everyone for participating today. I'd like to thank Martin again for his presentation. And I hope to see all of you in the reading group meetings over the next coming months. Thank you.